Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. He is one of the most highly respected constitutional law professors in America and one of our most prominent civil rights activists. He was the first African-American to be tenured at Harvard Law School, where he resigned to protest the school's failure to appoint women of color. He served as dean of the University of Oregon Law School, where again he resigned when the faculty refused to hire a qualified Asian-American woman. I first met him with his wife, Janet, when we picked him up after him being arrested protesting the Amadou Diallo shooting. He's Derek Bell, currently professor of law at New York University. He's the author of nine books, most recently, Silent Covenants and Ethical Ambition, as well as the now standard law school text, Race, Racism, and American Law. His legal articles have appeared in the most prestigious law journals, and he has been published or featured in all the major American news media. Welcome, Professor Bell. It's an honor. Thank you very much, Doug. Derek is fine. Oh, thank you. <laughs> As I noted in my intro, we first met with your wife, Janet, who was a student of mine at Baruch, when we picked you up at the first precinct after being arrested and protesting the Amadou Diallo shooting. Right. We've got the headlines. Cops face justice, facing 25 years. Here we're in a new millennium. Is the story the same? And what is the story? I think the story is that America views blacks other than the ones that they deem to have made it, and even they, uh, as, as threatening. I think they're threatening. And if you're in a poor neighborhood where the crime rate is high because the unemployment rate is high, uh, that's even more threatening. And even when, you know, uh, if uh, Tiger Woods uh, puts on a hooded sweatshirt and tries to jog around the wrong block, he's going to be in trouble. Although Tiger Woods is mm -hmm. saying, if Oprah, the greatly beloved. So, so what we have here is this sense that these guys are threatening. I can't say, because there have been some incidents in New York, uh, the one with the Jewish guy who was the kind of deranged, got killed, probably didn't, they didn't have to do that. Uh, but uh, uh, mainly it's in black neighborhoods or black folk who are deemed not in control. And I think that there's t a tendency to overreact. I mean, if you look, I mean, it's easy to tell somebody's going to get 25 years, and that, that's certainly not going to happen. But if, if you, we were police and, and sensing uh, what the society feels and reflecting that, and they're, you're kind of, we're the first line of defense. Then when guy, something like this horrible incident happens, you start shooting. Even even a black cop stops. That's right. Start shooting. That's right. It's That's irrespective right. of race, race at that point. That's right. Okay. Having read some of your most recent stuff as well as earlier stuff, as I noted to you earlier, I was both chagrined and uplifted by it. Uh, and I guess my chagrin began when I read the, the opening to Silent Covenants, mm -hmm. where you argue that racism is an integral, permanent, and indestructible component of this society. Yeah. It's irremediable? Probably. Probably. See, <clears throat> we live in this capitalist society, and let's call it what it is, that by definition means that some people are going to make a whole lot of money, gain a whole lot of power by the exploitation, if we want to use that word, of a whole lot of other people. Now, in that kind of society, how do you keep the people down below from rising up? In fact, some of the, back when capitalism was getting really started, some of the great thinkers of the time, 
uh, felt it couldn't work. It couldn't work because the people down below wouldn't rise up, particularly mm-hmm. if it was in a democratic situation where they could vote. But what has worked? And it's worked for a lot of reasons. There is just a sense that if you work hard, you can, the Alger, uh, what is it? Horatio Alger. Alger. Alger stories are, are, are certainly there. <clears throat> and so there are many components, but one of them is to have a group identifiable who are deemed on the bottom, even when they rise up. They're still on the bottom. Oh, there's exceptions. <clears throat> and so with that system, which we've been practicing for 300 years or more, um, even the lowliest, no account, unimpressive white man or woman uh, can feel that somehow I'm superior. There was this film of a Ku Klux Klan, uh, I can't think of it, uh, in which this old white guy, clearly poor, what have you, rises up to testify and said, every morning when I wake up, I thank God I'm white. He has nothing, you see. Let's take today's situation with affirmative action. It's just an amazing thing <clears throat> that I think, and maybe I'm wrong, that uh, if we had a, a national survey of whether the greater danger to this country was affirmative action or the growing disparity in income and wealth, maybe I'm paranoid, but I think affirmative action would be deemed the greater danger. And, and we have the law in a situation now in which there's this careful scrutiny of any kind of policy. I don't care how remunerative it is, how much it's uh, deemed benign, how much it's trying to help people who've been trod- downtrodden. It's, it's, it's examined under the closest judicial scrutiny about going to colleges, going to graduate schools. At the same time, Doug, we have a system in which major colleges, God knows what the lesser colleges do, have all kinds of special admits, the legacy admits, mm-hmm. the money admits. Doesn't make any difference. If so-and-so is on a list who have given a million bucks or so, then that child, that nephew, unless they're totally out of it, they're in. They're in. And there is, I mean, it's, I, I think I'm, there, I'm shocked, and yet there's no complaint. But, and this is endemic. That's right. And, That's right. And and the, 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 is is a progress an illusion that 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 we see. I mean, even in my lifetime, I could argue that I've seen progress. I I was in uh, Richmond, Virginia, with my mother when she took us to Washington D.C. in 1953. And it was colored water fountains, and I had the, the mistake in right. you know going over to drink water. Things have changed, but you're saying at at its root it hasn't, that's, that's and right. it can't. And the, no, but the, cha- the changes have. The well, changes no, no, happen. no, no, right. But the things have taken taken different forms. Uh, the subordination takes different forms okay. than, than it did. Okay, but, that's overt. But this is a, it, it's not because all white people are evil or bad. It's because the system requires that there be this out group. And in, in America, that's black folk. Now, you know, there's some stories that, well, and now the uh, people from the Middle East are, are, are facing that, and to some extent that's true. But we have all these hundreds of years of, of, of tradition. So that even at the highest levels, I, you know, you said, I'm, I'm a visiting faculty member. This is my 16th year at NYU. And John Sexton, uh, my former student, your longtime friend, who is now president and was dean, said after I left Harvard, oh, we'll put you up for tenure here. I said, John, thank you very much. Been there, done that. <laughs> right, because you would I have said, had to resign for something over yeah, there. Well, that's so, because uh, right. th- as a visitor, I don't have to deal with the faculty. Because the faculty there. This is a there, plus for you. That's right. The faculty there is as determined to hire people like themselves as they were at Harvard. Now, are the people like themselves dumb? Hell no. They're very smart. But it's a very narrow thing, and, and it includes people of color only incidentally, only wow. every little once in a while. And this is, the, this is not, the, and, and as I go around sp- speaking at other schools, it's the same thing. Now, these are the highest educated people, uh, more knowledgeable. They're not racist in any, uh, but when there's only two positions open, well, we should do a little bit about minority hiring, but it doesn't happen for the most part, unless there's a lot of a lot of pressure. And as you get further down the line, it doesn't get better. Okay. 
But at the same time, you have this belief. You read your work, whether it's silent covenants or certainly ethical ambition, and it's almost as if Derek Bell's saying, this is what I believe, but I'm going to work my damnedest to make my prophecy self-defeating. What is, what is it that keeps right. you going, given this rather pessimistic view of both the present and the future? I think that life is a miracle and an opportunity. And that while our society focuses on power, is particularly as represented by money, by celebrity, mm -hmm. and what have you, I'm not sure as I look at folk who have gained this, that there, there's a hell of a lot of happiness. There's a lot of unhappiness. Mm -hmm. I think I see a great deal of satisfaction and some degree of happiness in people who have determined to spend as much as they can on recognizing bad stuff and making it better. Okay. You know, uh, you don't have to. I think Christianity has gotten so off the rep. But ba Jesus' basic message was that your life, you get closer to God or what have you, by reaching out to others, by bringing people together. I mean, you know, the Jews were unhappy because he didn't come with a sword and what have you, but he was a greater revolutionary than those who came with a sword because they weren't going to do, do very well with the Romans. Mm -hmm. But his idea was to break down the purity system that was so endemic, um, to, uh, to have an outreach, to talk to, to God, loves uh, 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 those who love him, and you love him by doing for others. That was revolutionary, you see. And we've gotten so far from that, it is even funny. So part of what <clears throat> goes, the background to ethical ambition, which is really a, a non-religious book about the, 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 the values of good living, what are the roots of your your hope in this commitment? I mean, is, is, is it organized religion? Is it, is it belief in something above yeah. and beyond this that gives I, you and others this, this commitment? I think it's a lot of things. One of the things, it does bring the satisfaction, even when you lose. Okay. Even when you lose. Uh, sometimes you sometimes you win. But even when you lose, you don't feel bad that you have not just rolled over and taken it. Okay. Easy. No, you can't do that for everything. Some things you're just going to have to let go. But, but the, you, you build up points, I don't know about in heaven, but you build up points in your own okay. self that kind of carries you over the bad times, okay. you see. If you can say, Dag, I fought that battle, I lost, but I'm glad I fought it. You have a quote from Mrs. McDonald in Faces at the Bottom of the Well, where she says, I can't speak for everyone, but as for me, I'm an old woman. I lives to harass white folks. And this is a little lady way down in Leake County, Mississippi, a rural area. And in, in my non-wisdom, I had convinced those folks that they should desegregate their schools. And it ended up being the first school desegregation to take place uh, in fall of 1964. And they, those people caught hell. Okay, let's talk about that. Let's talk about what you call the the mistake, if you will, of Brown, and look at the mythology of Brown. You call, uh, and then in the opening of of uh, Silent Covenants, you call Brown a magnificent mirage. How is it a mirage? Why is it magnificent? And 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 and, and make your argument that you make in the book. It seems to me that for many years, we policymakers, lawyers, um, people with some pull, and maybe politicians to a certain extent, believe that segregation was the evil. And if you somehow got rid of the legal support for segregation, things would get better. Now, why we thought that, I'm not sure. But segregation was so endemic. You said yourself right. when you went to the South, you were put in, you know, white. It was, uh, colored, it was, it was really shocking. Right. You know? And so it was so much in your face that you thought, gee, if we could only get rid of that. And the schools were sort of the weak link 
of segregation. Mm -hmm. So you could desegregate this public facility or that, but uh, but 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 you really couldn't because you know they were there. But the weak link they felt was education, and that's what they started with. They uh, trying to equalize salaries that didn't, didn't work mm -hmm. very well. Equalize facilities. Finally decided desegregation, and they achieved desegregation in some of the colleges where uh, blacks had to leave the state in order to get particularly graduate education. But it worked up, and you finally got to Brown. And we thought that the, the court had recognized, and to some extent they had recognized, right. that separate but equal in the area of education just wasn't working. And we, almost what, an, inher an inherent that separate was unequal. What we, what we didn't recognize is that Brown came about in 1954 rather than years. Was, school desegregation suits had been filed since 1850. And what we didn't realize is that in 1954, we had what I call, and some other words, the interest convergence. Yes. That is, blacks only, and I think other groups too, but blacks dramatically only make progress not when they are suffering serious injustices, including slavery or segregation, not when they are able to make great proof of this suffering available in courts or what have you, but when the policymakers recognize that what the blacks are seeking will serve their interests, will further their interests. And in the 1950s, remember that was the uh, McCarthy, McCarthy era. Right. Two years before was Dennis versus United States where they sent these four scholars to prison for a long time uh, under a conspiracy statute, the Smith Act, for teaching Marx and Trotsky and what have you. Mm. Teaching, that's mm. all the proof they mm. had. And, and, and yet, there was such fear that about the, about the, about the uh, communist uh, countries making a big deal with regard to the segregation here and what have you. There was a, a fear here mm -hmm. that blacks coming back from the war were not going to take this stuff anymore. So that this decision served to improve our foreign relations and could kind of make uh, serve as a proof that, well, this country wasn't so bad after all. And so everybody applauded. So this is sort of the latent you. underlying reasons of that, that... I think. Okay, it's not, in, it's not in the opinion. Go ahead. But what the proof of it is that the very next year when white folk, which this court was a fear, mm -hmm. rose up and they were going to succeed and everything else, the court backed away. Mm -hmm. They didn't honor the NACP lawyers who wanted immediate desegregation, mm -hmm. which might have worked better than what... They sent it back with this all deliberate speed, which right. the South interpreted as never. Right. And so it was many, many years before there was any desegregation at all. Finally, we, the court started giving us really effective orders. I mean, they really hard hitting. But you couldn't, couldn't keep white folk from mo moving. So this school that had been desegregated suddenly was depopulated. Was depopulated. The first desegregation, they would close the black schools, fire the black teachers, you know, and send the black kids to not the best white schools, but to the worst, where the problems would be most serious, and where the whites weren't getting a very good, mm -hmm. getting a very good mm -hmm. education. So that the, and then over the years, the the resistance remained. Whites kept leaving, and uh, uh, so that you ended up uh, with that decision being honored, but in terms of enforceability, either in education or in any place else, worthless because it relied on intentional, provable right. segregation, discrimination, and that doesn't happen. And in, and in fact, it, it seems to have worked best, if you will, because of the reaction to it, the violation of it, the white reaction to yeah. it, which horrified everyone else and led to substantial changes but, in the 60s. But maybe, but mainly in other areas than education. Right. You know, because Facilities, the, the, the voting people, rights. Because, and those came about because of the marches. And again, that uh, interest convergence worked again, didn't it? Mm -hmm. you know? Go ahead. Right. So that the, uh, uh, there was recognition that, boy, we thought we'd make more money with segregation. It turns out that we black folk down, filling up the streets, everybody's staying home. So we need to desegregate. And they thought, oh, we'll make even more money with black people because they spend a, lot, spend a lot of money. Okay. So that part worked because the interest convergence was ongoing. Does that mean that... In, in what, New York restaurants. When did you last see a black waiter? 
in a, in a good New York restaurant. I, don't go, I, can't, aff I can't afford good <laughs> New York restaurants, so I don't know. I don't get there very often, but you see very few. Okay. Place. What are these silent covenants that, that in a sense, thwarts mm. social progress in a large sense or racial social progress in a specific sense? I, I think it is this unspoken, unacknowledged, maybe unrecognized that uh, two things. The first one is that I uh, said with regard to interest convergence, mm -hmm. that that's the only time major progress is made. And then something that my uh, friend Lonnie Guinier up at Harvard uh, calls interest uh, uh, divergence. That is when white groups are at, at loggerheads with one another. Their compromise often takes the form of taking away black rights. That's the framers, right? Some were for slavery, insisted on slavery. Others were opposed to it. And they, and they compromised by a, a series of agreements, uh, provisions in the Constitution that guaranteed protection of property and slaves. Sure. Um, 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 that's the uh, Emancipation Proclamation. You know, it sounds great, everything, but when you look at it carefully, uh, it did a lot for the country in terms of uh, discombobulating the southern workforce, which were the, were the slaves, uh, keeping England and France from coming in on the side of the Confederacy, mm -hmm. because the, um, uh, um, the anti-slavery people in those countries would uh, see that didn't happen. And it enabled uh, the enlistment of 200,000 or more mm -hmm. former black slaves into the Union forces, who became cannon fodder for the most part, weren't wanted, but help win the war, help win the war. Now, what did the blacks get out of that? You got this Emancipation Proclamation, which you, when you read it carefully, freed not one person. Right. You see. So that was a that was another. And the Hayes Tilden. You know, you can go right there. Affirmative action. Affirmative go ahead. action is, which was is not something the civil rights people thought up. It's something that after King was killed, after the riots started, whites who hadn't done much of anything since Brown decided, oh, oh we better do something. So uh, it, it government and um, uh, uh, institutions of higher learning and corporations, we brought in some folks, you know. And for a while, that would seem good. But then the reaction again, why are those black people getting those jobs? I want those, those jobs. I want those positions. And you started having the lawsuits. And slowly but surely, um, any use of race, the only use of racial classifications you had left were in these affirmative action programs. And whites could challenge them and have the court look with the same scrutiny that they once looked at segregated mm -hmm. policies. And so uh, in the most the, the two cases before the Supreme Court now and of schools kind of voluntary desegregation plans, that is not court ordered, right. um, have very little chance of success because they at some point use race in the assignment process. Okay. okay. So that it's kind of turned the whole thing around. So the one thing that started off as interest convergence, slowly turned over to interest uh, divergence, mm -hmm. and and you had that pattern again. We could spend the rest of the morning. Uh, on, well, we'll on do it when, we, when we're finishing <laughs> off. Said we certainly will. In uh, faces at the bottom of the well, I guess it's the third of a series of books that that really are very different. I mean, you wouldn't expect it from a law professor where you use allegorical stories and mythical characters to highlight, and, and legal analysis mm -hmm. and rigorous analytical thinking to, to demonstrate the realities of the, of the black experience. And, it, and, and it's been called critical race theory. How did you come to this this paradigm of writing and with your fictional civil rights leader, uh, Geneva Crenshaw? It's, it's a good story. I, I, I guess I always wanted to be a writer, but I had no models as writers when I was growing up. But I had models as lawyers and a, and a judge, and they were very encouraging. And, a, and I didn't envision that cold water flat thing being very good. So I went to law school and uh, then became a civil rights lawyer. And then finally, because of this affirmative action thing, got to start teaching. I had no job offers a year before King was killed. 
um, a half dozen job offers the year after. I'm the same guy, but uh, that's, the that's, that's, how, that's, that's right. how, it, how it worked. And I'd been I'd write, been I'd been writing since law uh, law school, but the um, the Harvard Law School has a, a law review. The first issue each year has a review of the Supreme Court, but at the beginning of it, there's a foreword that they usually ask some of the great legal scholars in the field to write. It may be about the cases, it may be about some other area. And in, I guess, 1985, they asked me to, to do it. And I said, boy, you know, uh, sinner, don't let this harvest pass. You know, I wanted to buy, write about race, but to write about it in the strictly legal stuff with thousands of footnotes, and it was just gonna be boring. And the editors uh, said, you know, if you did one of those kind of things, it would be mediocre, but it wouldn't matter. Uh, but if you're going to write this fiction, we really have to worry. And we, they helped me, and we worked very hard. And that was the beginning, because it was four stories. Uh, first time ever, and probably the last time ever, that the Harvard uh, Law Review Forward would be basically four allegorical uh, stories. And then uh, a publisher saw it and said, well, why don't you work this into a book? And that's how uh, good old Martin Kessler, late of, uh, late, uh, uh, president of Basic Books. And well, I would recommend, I mean, and, and, and unfortunately time's running out, I would certainly recommend this book and Space Traders, which was an HBO movie and right. really a remarkable example of this new critical race theory. Mm. Okay, we've got 30 seconds left. What's next for Derek Bell? You writing, are you writing? I know you're teaching and yeah. you love the teaching. No, I and mean, teaching is probably my main contribution to the whole professional area. And, and teaching at NYU is just a, a great, I mean, I can't believe they pay me too. Uh, so that uh, I, I understand. I'm going to this. I'm probably keep doing that as long as I can. But I also have some other writing projects I would like to and do. Share, you know, briefly. Well, another writing project dealing maybe with Geneva Crenshaw's daughter that I didn't know that she had. Oh. So the and who was a very feisty, um, you know, contemporary con woman. Yeah. Oh, yeah. we're waiting. So, Looking forward. So you're coming back when Geneva. Oh, what's Geneva's daughter's name? Genesee. Genesee. Okay, when so, Genesee reaches the page, we'll talk. Very good. Be glad to do it. My yep. pleasure. Thank you. Great. Thank you.